Feeling Orange is a uh, project uh, exploring it. It was a four month project during the fall semester. It was about exploring 15 stations uh, on the Metro Orange Line from uh, Villa Maria to Rosemont. Uh, so yeah, we're a group of 30 researchers from the, uh, the School of Architecture at McGill University. And we were assisted by uh, professors Martin Bressani and uh, Aaron Frey. So first, uh, Martin will talk about more of the theoretical aspect of the project and the notion of affect. Uh, then Aaron will talk about the process and the use of uh, digital technologies. Uh, Martina will then uh, go through the, the, the projects and finally we'll end with a general discussion uh, answering the questions. So, thank you. Thank you, Fuzi. Uh, thanks, Fabrizio. And I want to thank Phyllis, of course, uh, Mirko, unfortunately is not here, and Fabrizio and the team of designers that put up the exhibition. We're very happy to have a little space in that uh, very fascinating exhibition. Um, First thing, uh, I want to see the project, just a bit repeating what uh, Fuzi just said. The project's about raising the underground city, underground Montreal, and making it visible. Everyone speaks of Montreal as an underground city, but nobody sees it. Uh, so our project's about pulling up the bowels of the city, which normally are hidden. What our project was about, therefore, was to use one underground system, the Orange Metro Line, and bring it up at specific specific points, the metro station, so that rhythmically through the city, the underground will become an overground in the form of a series of vertical structure, which you'll see later. So the project seeks to publicize an hidden aspect of the city as a, sor as a sort of a return of the repressed. The project is a return of the repressed in more ways than one. As for this studio, we adopted a radically subjective approach to the question of the city. No program, no statistics, no diagrams, no flowcharts, no mappings of any kind. The students' feelings, their direct lived experience led the way. The project thus began through urban driftings in groups of two, promenades centered around specific metro stations of the Orange Line. The various stations allocated to the student defined a vaguely um, circumscribed zone a psychological territory, not an objectively defined site. We enjoy emphasizing the color denomination of the metro line as orange was already the sign of an effective orientation. And the orange is between my um, uh, sweater and the uh, yellowish orange on the screen. <laughs> um, so the studio was titled Feeling Orange, Feeling the Orange Line but also orange as a feeling. We use uh, Olaf Eliasson's weather project with its artificial orange sun as a frontispiece to the studio outline. That first step led to a series of effective readings, crystallized in photographic form, the feeling being encapsulated digitally. And Aaron will address the digital portion of this later on. No, just stay to the first. So we produced uh, a number of these photographs, but uh, Aaron will speak about that later. The assumption that drove the decision for such a subjective beginning, and we must here emphasize how much importance we lay on beginnings, was that architecture is primarily about the creation of effective sites. Material reality may well be architecture's proper domain insofar as architecture coordinates materials into specific configurations at the service of institutions and property. It compartmentalizes and allocates space, it creates limits and boundaries that serve social functions. From an architectural perspective, however, the material configuration of the world is not merely a matter of quantities, the architect being acutely aware that the world's appearance is always meaningfully given. His work is precisely to bring out qualities from what first seem merely quantities. In our opinion, the primary goal of architecture is to concentrate energy and effect in particular places or sites as an expression of our caring about these places. Architecture invests space with the principle of excessiveness, marking sites with unusual intensity. It is the intensity that matters rather than meaning. As such, our approach is resolutely and deliberately superficial. We believe that it is the effective investment in particular sites that bonds people around particular representations and realities. Effect is precisely the investment of energy that anchors people in particular practices, identities, and meanings. Architecture thus locates effect. 
In order to emerge as effective landscapes, building must be conceived in terms of intensification, of sensational intensification, an environment in which the boundary between subject and object is blurred. Such sensational intensification blurred in their limits and contours we call the creation of atmospheres. An atmosphere is a bundle of sensations diffused. It is ambiance or stimul or the spatial bearers of mood. Affects do not have determinate objects. They are non-intentional, non-cognitive. They permeate our thoughts, desires, and motivations, and thus have an unbounded flame on our attitudes. Through atmosphere, through the air, affects are immersive, like a sort of broad emotional climate. We live through and within them. We slip into effect like we slip into moods. Affects deteriorate, disperse, vanish, and reappear. They are dynamic realities, and architecture serves to stabilize them. Thank you. Aaron. Great. Thank you, Martin. By the way, this is the kind of discussion we had for a semester where Martin would come with this point of view, I would come with another point of view, um, and, and then the students would actually react on all this. So in this second part of our talk, um, I would like to address three conditions regarding the nature of technology in architecture, uh, because that's my feed, and the application in the context of our design research and pedagogy. Nice, actually, yeah, that, that would be the one. I define these three conditions in terms of intensity, extensity, and potentiality. Next. With the increasing reliance on uh, information technologies, architects and designers are now confronted to large sets of data that ultimately generate an augmented reality in terms of the architectural object. To illustrate this condition, our research group first analyzed the atmospheric qualities of multiple locations distributed along the uh, orange metro line in Montreal. This first set of information was then confronted to the production of multi-material rapid prototype objects that you see here, and that aimed at reflecting the affective dimension of the site. <coughs> Fifteen locations along the orange line were investigated solely in terms of their affective dimension. A total of about 4,500 photos were taken during the day and the night and analyzed in our studio. And this process ultimately led to two images per station that best exemplifies the atmospheric condition of the site above and underground. The resulting 30 images are in fact on display here in the gallery and stand in relation or maybe we, we, we could say in friction with these uh, 15 rapid prototyped objects. These objects aimed at translating the atmospheric qualities of the various sites in the most literal sense. Texture, transparencies, porosities, material qualities, and colors were carefully modeled and manufactured using a sophisticated uh, multi-material rapid prototyping equipment that is now implemented uh, uh, at uh, our research, research laboratory live at, uh, at the School of Architecture. The uniqueness of these objects rests on the fact that each of them embeds a material modulation that is manufactured through a single procedure. In other words, in other words, um, these objects were produced in one single piece and did not require any form of assemblage. In fact, the fabrication of these objects relies on the chemistry of polymers that are mixed and cured using uh, a particular UV light system. And so in that sense, the fabrication of these objects exemplifies this notion of technological intensity by which we succeed now to embed an ever-increasing amount of information from within the object. Intensity can also be understood by the fact that these objects provide an augmented reality, or in other words, the exacerbation of our senses while touching and manipulating them physically. These objects provide multiple readings, out of which there is one that I find myself important, and that is the fact that you can look at them, or I would invite you to look at them, in terms of the way textures and materials evolve along their surface. Next. Extensity is the second notion that I would like to address as it refers directly to the organization of our studio and the team structure. By extensity, I refer to the idea that our technological tools foster continuity between disciplines, sources of knowledge, and practices. 
Our studio exemplified this condition from the very beginning. In fact, to the difference of most uh, design studio today, Martin and I propose a new form of architectural investigation that is based on our respective disciplines, or expertise, I would say, namely history and theory and digital technology. Our collaboration and the discussions in the group were therefore oscillating between treaties in psychology, philosophy, architecture and history, as well as material research, digital fabrication, and even computational programming. These discussions with the members of the team led to the development of new ideas that ultimately got translated into virtual and physical models. And this is what I mean by extensity. The ability for our team to harness a technological capability to continuously stream and screen information and knowledge from multiple sources using an open source approach. This notion of open source got expressed in the physical context of the studio. Whereas traditional design studio still promote the individual work of the student, our first action was to remove all partitions in the space while consolidating the tables as a continuous surface on which team members would interact. The studio turned into one large space filled with machines, wires, and books, as well as found objects, beds, and couches, I won't show you the pictures of those ones, that would allow a continuous presence and research activity. This physical condition reflects the fact that human interaction remains at the core of our architectural activities or in other, in other words, the proliferation of social networks and the possibility to work remotely cannot replace the human experience of sharing sensitivities. Okay, you can leave that one. The third notion that I describe as potentialities refers to the influence of digital technology in our iterative process that stands at the core of the architectural research on display in the gallery. This condition got expressed in our research in terms of a multiplicity of approaches and the production of 15 visions regarding the future of Montreal and the performative dimension of architecture today. Whereas these proposals are just a few miles from each other, they offer radically different approaches in terms of materiality, program distribution, light treatment, and structural definitions, among others. These proposals that Martina will introduce in a moment do not promote an ideal geometry nor an architectural solution per se, but instead a collection of provisional visions that are critical of the way one perceives the city today. So, as I said, Martina will introduce that in a minute. And what you will see is that the proposed visions do not stem from a preconceived program or site constraint. Instead, our intention was to experiment with the possibility to literally generate an architecture out of the affective qualities of the 15 objects and analysis of the sites that you've seen. Probably due to the power of their formal expression, the projects that we developed are profoundly influenced by the geometries and material definition of these, of these objects. Programs, events, scenarios, skin, structure, and other aspects of the projects naturally stem from these objects that were, after all, conceived almost as a sort of automatic writing of architecture in the most Dadaist sense. I described the notion of intensity, extensity, and potentiality as three conditions that stand at the core of our work and pedagogy. They reflect the continuum of knowledge between history, theory, and technology, as well as between the man, the machine, and the city. This continuum led us to create a synergy between two aspects of architecture, the affect and the form, the man and the object. Two aspects that are in fact inherently part of the history of experimental architecture here in Montreal. As featured in Alessandro Ponte's uh, Total Environment Exhibition and Research here in the at the CC a few years ago, Montreal-based experimenters such as François D'Alegre and Maurice Demer exemplify this commitment to reconsider the city as an entity formed by technological machines where information penetrates and circulates onto the surface. Promoting a connective system where the dialectical relation between human and nature is reconfigured into a fused, integrated, and limitless platform, their proto-realist environments prefigured a spontaneous, non-conflicting cultural arrangements in which the collective gave way to the connective the causal event to the, to the fiction, and the rigid structure to the open system. Similarly, 
the project that you will see in a moment now, Feeling Orange, is a project that addresses this continuum between the man and the machine, the affect and the form. So it is now time to review the 15 proposal with uh, our colleague Martina. Thank you. So we began our journey on the orange line at, I would, well, first off, I would briefly describe each project with a few key words. And uh, so we begin at the Villamarine station with uh, the work done by Jacinthe Picard and Saru Martinez. And each other is only a few ex short extracts of each project. Oh yes, it's not the complete project, it's just a few key images that really describe it. So their project was called the Munizin Love Hotel. So it was a love hotel. This is the overground image. So as Aaron and Martin have said, we began with two images, overground and underground, which then were the, where we got our atmospheres from, which then became the objects that we want to see that. This is their underground image. Of the <coughs> and their effective object. And this is the translation of that object into a building. And key words that describe their project is um, sensual, procession, enchanted, So next, we arrive at Vendôme Station with um, the work done by Brian Spatzner and Guillaume Tehavi. And their project is called the Piranesi Landscape, which would play playscape, which is basically an open, um, multi level playground. This is their overground photo. And, and how the atmospheric qualities of those images were then transformed into this object. So words to describe their project would be playful, ephemeral, and tensegrity. We arrive now at Place Henri with the work done by her husband, Yetian Fuziwadi. Their project is called the Vivarium, which is in... Um, a bird conservatory. Yes, it's a bird, it's a, it's a bird conserv conservatory. Their overground image, the underground. And their object. So words describing their project, I'm sorry, words describing their project would be synergetic, topology, and intertwined. We now arrive at Lionel Crow Station, done by Mathieu Tremblay, and his project is called the Urban Obelisk, which is a retired um, old folks home. This is an exterior image. Interior. And this object. So at Georges Vanny Station, we have a, a project by Stéphanie Vallian and Paul Vioitu. And these are their images of the above ground and below ground. 
and their 3D printed object. Words to describe their project would be continuum, contrast, and ambiguity. Fabrizio, we are adding keywords to the keywords of ABC Mantra. We take them all. <laughs> And now we have the hiatus tower at Station Lucien Lally by Edith and Caroline. The overground image. And the, bell, and the object. So this is a space of transition. It deals with the past and the present. Voids and dissolving. Then comes Etienne and my project called The Bank at Bonaventure Station. This is our overground image. Underground. Our object. And our project was or words encapsulating our object would be attractive node, trust, power, and motion. Next we have at Square Victoria Rising Roots by Esther and Claudia. and their 3D printed object. And words to describe their project would be elegant and reaching. At Place Down Station, we have the Tour Medusa by Christophe and Benjamin. That's the monster. Get ready. <laughs> Printed object. This is their project. So, words describing their project would be bridging, unchained, and textured. Um, so, at Champ de Mars, we have Trip the Life Fantastic by Pierre and Brandon. And their effective object. So we have duality, out of sync, dance, and extrapolation as words that would describe the project. At Bayview Camp Station, we have Xylem by Veronica and Robert. So we have disseminated fibers, connectivity, fluid, and dissolving as keywords. At Sherbrooke Station, we have Loam by uh, Jan and Theodore. And their project is an organic waste facility slash public space. So this is their exterior <coughs> image. Interior. An effective object. Keywords to describe their project would be submersive public space. Performance and in 
profitable? I make it. <laughs> At Mount Royal Station, we have the memory organ by Jack and Hattie. We spoke before, so this is their exterior image. Keywords describing their project would be a memory organ, progressive, spectacle, Look, at the Laurier station, we have Alien by Robert and Hanhan. Their effective object. So Alien would be a good word to describe their project. Um, foreign, a beacon. And, and finally, we end at Rosemont Station with Maison de Rosemont by Pater and Luan. Their effective object. Words to describe their project would be memory, industry, and ruin. And we will now show a video that Potter and Luan did that sums up what our projects um, sort of do for the city of Montreal with a little brief.
Well, if you want to look at the projects in more detail, there's a, a PDF actually of all the, the whole document we produced uh, in the exhibition also on, the, on an iPad. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, it's time for the discussion now, and I will also invite my my colleagues uh, to answer uh, if it's related to any particular project. So questions? Questions or, or, statements. or statements? Or objections? Or objections? I didn't do it. <laughs> um, the, well, a few things I want to say. Um, Uzi uh, mentioned that there's a whole book, and what we see here, uh, which relates to your question, by the way, uh, there's a whole set of technical drawings that are very complete, in which most of the work of the students were actually to domesticate and actually make realizable these rather crazy objects. So much of the work is not seen here. We've just shown very impressionistic views of objects that actually be technically very uh, developed fairly um, well. Uh, so I encourage you to look at the iPad. Um, the, uh, it was very liberal, it was extremely liberal. Uh, we wanted very little um, metaphoric uh, on, you know, trying to reinterpret. We just wanted this thing to go ahead this was also a matter of time. Like we, all of this was quite the big project for um, only 13 weeks. So basically, the object, the, the link between the photographs and the object is very discontinuous, as you probably noticed, except on a few more obvious cases. Uh, it's really setting a sort of mood for work. Uh, then using the tool for what it can do, um, and then really just go for it and just. Um, take the object and assume that it's, what is, how does that work as a building? Then what, what is this thing could be as a program? How can you enter this thing? How can you move through? How can the atmosphere generate a certain sense of social gathering? It was all from the object, but in a quite, um, I would say literal way, but that's my vision of maybe students would like to say something. Maybe, uh, and, and we don't need a mic anyway, so anyone who wants to intervene. Oh, we need Do you need a mic? Will that be performed? Oh, because of the recording, yes. the mic is useful. Yes. Okay, that's right. So what do you want to say? Anybody wants to add something on that question? I'd like to add that uh, you know, from the photographs, uh, you know, the photographs are really the, the, the samples that really capture the in the atmospheres of each uh, districts or metro stations, uh, you know, for the underground and the overground. But also the the objects represented, uh, at least for our team, it was really about the intrinsic qualities of those spaces. Um, you know, whether it is it is about the senses or about the form, or you know, at the end, it's, it's really subjective. But uh, it was really, a, to me, the big step was from the photograph to the object. Uh, you know, translating those the, the atmosphere, the feelings that came to me first, the, you know, the intuitive uh, reactions. Um, and really translating these, uh, these, these qualities into uh, an object that you could manipulate. So. I have a curiosity. Why is there such a strong predominance of towers? Okay. Very tall towers, by the way. Yeah. Now, I knew that that question would come in. But wait, it, 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 it's it's a given. It, it was a, somehow a given, and uh, um, so so there were there, there were some uh, basic uh, parameters at the beginning of that experiment. Uh, in fact, one of them being even the dimension of those objects. And, you know, it actually was part of a debate we had in the group. The the what what was interesting was is also is the fact that those kinds of decisions about those parameters that we, we would be working uh, on. Um, in the case of Martin and I, is that these um, uh, requirements are coming very late and even sometimes in discussion with the entire group, which is actually sometimes surprising because, again, in a traditional uh, design studio setting, uh, you would actually receive a brief and work accordingly. So in this case, uh, we, we in fact uh, refrain from uh, bringing those kinds of architectural constraints uh, in order to, in fact, give the effective, uh, you know, maximum uh, space for this affected, the diversity of those affective 
dimensions that we could find on, on the side. Yeah, but, but then there's a, another thing um, that, that uh, I wanted to add, and that is that the fact that we are ending up with those tall buildings, often skyscrapers, I think is also, it's, it's also uh, linked to a certain political statement about the city of Montreal, and the need uh, that there is to, in fact, start investigating some transgressive actions in the city. I, I think that what happens is that the, the, there is, of course, a very strong movement for conserving, for preserving, uh, uh, of course, very valuable monuments in the city. But I think that these these kinds of political decisions should come in tune also with the possibility to experiment and to be very transgressive about the city. I think that the Canterbury city is about that as well. Um. Um, one other thing is the idea that we made visible the subway. We, so we actually had the idea that you would have a panorama of these 15 towers rhythmically showing the orange line literally as a kind of iconic set of objects, but we didn't get there. Uh, the other thing was that so much about desires that the skyscraper as an icon we thought would, would allow that expressivity. There's one uh, students that didn't do that. They were the more politically oriented group who wanted to do, um, you know, this kind of climatic machine made from um, basically a composting machine, which would create this this artificial climate just off Carlo kind of Saint Louis, and, and theirs was horizontal. So there was a possibility of transgressing our terms. <laughs> Talking about transgression. So one uh, student said that most people were happy to experiment with that, but it did create a lot of Martina. Uh, at some point, was really kind of, you know, Martina and uh, Etienne were a bit saying, why do I do this? And then they went completely nuts on their specifications. <laughs> uh, and maybe, Martina, you want to talk about that, maybe, or Etienne? Where is Etienne? Or whatever. Oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. Well, I know at first, many of us were wondering why do this guy's prefer, especially because there's a hype in it already set why we should go above it, or like why should we not respect the rules. But at some point we also just decided to go with the spirit, with the atmosphere of the project and just explore it and make fee of the actual urban limits and just try to explore without setting us more boundaries that already exist. I don't know if it makes sense. But <laughs> I think we're going to have time for one more. Yes. Uh, yes. Except they had a program in it, elevators, floor plans, and they 
it made sense. You, your, your models don't make sense. No, no, no. It's not that. It actually makes sense, Peter. They have programs. Every floor plan has been, it has been worked out. Please go see the, that's why I was saying earlier, it can get confusing that way. The projects are quite worked out. Contextually, by the way, I would say in the base of the skyscraper was a lot of work made on the street level. So that the connect, the actual physical connection to the ground was very important when we thought about some more successfully, some less, but a lot of energy was put there at the contact point of the tower to the ground. The actual expressivity of the tower didn't bother us at all. In fact, that's what we were trying to look for. Um, did it, did it so it transcend uh, like a visual or formal translation? Because a lot of you said literal one. Yeah, but the architecture is about form. It's about expression. It's about creating effective sites. It's not about copying the next door neighbor. No, of course not. So, you know, so you see the last film is very interesting that way, where there was a whole research mm -hmm. done on Rosemont, it was particularly interpret like it's a specific interpretation of Rosemont. I'm sure a lot of people living in Rosemont would say that's not my reality. <laughs> uh, but it was uh, a thinking about that, and obviously they create this post-industrial kind of fictional um, food factory and soup kitchen, so homeless shelter, which is an extravagant art nouveau piece. You may feel that that's not contextual. Some people may say it's very interestingly interpreting a place. So, you know, I mean, the, con the question of contextuality for me is, is some, I find sometimes misled. I mean, this is the notion of a small, humane, small scale, flower pots, you know. No, nothing like that. It's, it's maybe that when I see that final movie, I'm thinking, you know, very, it's very much driven by, like, an it seems like an escapist attitude rather than something that's really, you know, it's the difference between something completely new. You know, you go on a computer and generate something completely new. Like, like what in Montreal is a result of an I'm not, of story? I'm sorry, okay. <laughs>